Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and it is outstanding to be alongside Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Good to see you as always, guys. Good see to see you, Darcy. And today we've got a little bit of a mixed bag but with a real focus on women's health. Well, any effort to close the gender gap is proven to have massive health, economic and social benefits for everyone. Because it is true, Dr Nick, isn't it, that men and women have different health needs? Yeah, and actually our women do live a little bit longer than our men, 85 as opposed to our 81 years. And for us, heart disease is still our biggest killer, where sadly for women, dementia is the number one cause of death. But what about when it comes to diet? We all know about the benefits of a Mediterranean diet, but it's particularly relevant when it comes to women. Yes, so a new study from the University of Sydney has shown that a Mediterranean diet can reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease by 24% and sudden death by almost as much. So that's lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains and, of course, healthy fats. And you can add to that plenty of tomatoes, fish and the absolutely yummy extra virgin olive oil. Delicious. Now, we've always known that a Mediterranean diet was good for health, but this is the first study done in women to show the cardiovascular benefits. All right, so we're right across what we should and shouldn't be eating. Mm. But, of course, health screenings are right up there as well. And I understand that we women let that slide during the pandemic with a decline on breast screening. So it's true that cancer screening of all kinds during lockdowns decreased. And we're really worried that there might be an increase in diagnoses as a result, including particularly on breast cancer. Well, we've got to get out there and get our mammograms, ladies, because the health professionals say, don't delay, breast cancer does not wait. So what we've seen through the pandemic is a decline in participation rates through breast screen. There's been a decline of 9% nationally. And what that means is that then often we are not able to treat breast cancer or pick it up early. And we start to see late stage presentations. And the earlier we can pick up breast cancer diagnosis, the better outcomes that people will have. We really encourage those people to get checked out early if they notice any symptoms, but also if they notice symptoms between screening appointments that they actually go and seek advice from their medical practitioner or GP. It's important to understand that risk of getting breast cancer is one in seven for women. And there is a myth that some people believe that if a family member has had breast cancer, that you're most likely to get breast cancer. However, understanding that risk is really important. So talking to your GP or health practitioner to understand that is what we would encourage people to do. So a period of time there was a backlog of appointments, so certainly Breast Screen have worked nationally to try and combat the backlog of, of those people wanting to attend an appointment for Breast Screen, but certainly it's not only the appointments and availability of screening, but it's also people prioritising their health and prioritising screening as a preventative mechanism to ensure that they actually detect something early. Particularly over the last few years, we have seen that people have not necessarily prioritised their health. And so for a number of reasons, whether that's work priorities, uh, putting yourself last, uh, looking after elderly parents, and also the challenges that the pandemic has presented, the message is clear that we really do encourage people to reactivate those appointments, keep up their regular health checks, and uh, particularly breast screen. The main message is that breast cancer won't wait. And so early detection is pivotal to ensure that we see better outcomes for people diagnosed with breast cancer. Free breast cancer screenings are available to women aged over 40 every two years. So if you've been putting yours off, it's time to make an appointment. Nick, a lot less common, but something men still need to be aware of as well? Yes, um, breast cancer in men is much, much less common. Mm. Only about 200 cases diagnosed every year. I've never actually seen it myself. But funnily enough, the way to prevent breast cancer in men, the way you help is the same as with women, which is regular exercise, keep weight under control and limit your alcohol intake. Now, Nick, I have a question for you. I, I don't know if you're aware of cheat days. Have mm. you heard of this? You know, where you, you eat really well on five or six days and then you maybe pig out on a pizza on the <laughs> seventh day. Is that ever OK? Are you saying pizza isn't healthy? <laughs> no, it's perfectly OK. One or two cheat meals a week is not going to spoil an otherwise healthy diet. I don't so much go for the cheap meals as the cheap glass or two of wine. Yes. That's my, you know, thing sure. I can't resist. Bit of a subscriber to the eighty twenty rule, Nick. So eighty percent of the time you're doing your best, twenty percent just let it <laughs> go. Just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> 
life is for enjoying, right? And I have to tell you, I never thought I'd say this, but one of my absolute favourite things now to have a little cheat with is a Portuguese tart. Okay. It's because of this story I was lucky enough to do, I must say. It has to be the real deal, though. Be lucky for me, I discovered that there is a little slice of Portugal right here on our doorstep. 20 years ago, Ruben and Nelson met at language classes. Neither had worked in the food industry before. Being of a Portuguese background, lots of people would always ask us, where can we get a good Portuguese tart in Melbourne? And there wasn't really, you know, anywhere in Melbourne that we thought that represented in the way that they should be. And I think, for me, that's when we kind of thought that if they already love what they're eating at the moment, imagine if they had what it's really like over there. That's what it was for me. So inspired by the love and demand for the tarts from their homeland, Nelson, a painter, and Ruben, a phone repairer, decided to set up shop. We went to Portugal to try a lot of different Portuguese tarts, and I was trained by a pastry chef on how to laminate the pastry. The most critical is just that you move fast, because we're working with butter. Um, so we just got to make sure that the layers don't infuse together. So I'm imagining when you told everybody you were opening this business, there was a lot of, so, just tarts? Before we opened, that that was the biggest thing we kept hearing, just yeah, tarts. Just tarts, just tarts. Nothing just tarts. Else. But then after we opened this store, we opened our second store and no one said that. What is so special about a Portuguese tart? The pastry, the custard coming together. Once you start, you just want another bite of another one and just next thing you know, it's just two, three, four, bang. You see them coming out of the oven, you can't get any fresher than what we're doing. It's a very visual thing, what we're doing here, so we like that everyone can see the whole process, from laminating to making them by hand, then getting loaded with custard, then getting loaded into the oven, and then obviously out for our customers to eat. I just like to watch people have their, their first Portuguese tart. I'd rather not tell you and just, I don't know, just watch. I'm excited. Enjoy. Enjoy. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is amazing. Thank you. I think this is a life-changing moment for me. <laughs> Oh, that actually was my first ever Portuguese really? tart. And I have yep. to tell you, oh, the crispy pastry with the custard warm from the oven, delicious. <laughs> well, they are chock full of dairy. And when it comes to a replacement for cow's milk, the big trend, get this, it's not soy or almond, it's actually camel's milk. Jeez, that sounds like a bridge too far <laughs> for, for me. most of uh, us. <laughs> oh, I'm an almond latte uh, drinker. Is there anything we haven't turned into milk these days? Anything left? Well, actually, there's... <laughs> South Australia's only camel, camel milk dairy. It's hard to say and hard to believe, I must say. But they are experiencing a massive surge in demand. And from GPs and health specialists as well. What do you think, Dr Nick? Well, it's amazing what I learned doing the show, Joe. Yeah, we all do. Because it turns out camel's milk is actually really low in sugar, fat and lactose and also has plenty of minerals like potassium and iron. And it's also being tagged as good for gut health, so you'd love it. You'd love it, Joe. Would I? <laughs> but so it's, it may be a good alternative for those who are dairy intolerant, but maybe go and have a chat with your health professional first. Well, up next, Jack, is there anything worse than being called hormonal? Well, Joe, you know <laughs> what? I feel like it's time to start embracing it. So we're going to take a look at the superpowers of female hormones. That's after the break. There are so many extraordinary older women who are absolutely shining at the moment. NASA has just appointed their first female science chief, solar expert, Dr Nicola Fox. 
And 60-year-old actor Michelle Yeoh used her historic Oscars speech to tell women, ladies, don't let anyone tell you you're past your prime. I love that. I loved it too. And Jamie Lee Curtis was right up there with her. Absolutely adored that moment. You know, none of us want to lose what we love as we get older, and nor should we. But the fact is our bodies do change as we age. And what it does mean is saying goodbye to one of our internal superheroes, oestrogen. But it doesn't mean you have to say goodbye to your superpower. I think what's most important in talking about hormones in women is to talk about oestrogen because that's the really important hormone that we know gives us quite a bit of health protection. Oestrogen has a really central role in reproductive health, but it actually goes through every tissue in our body. And that's not actually what all things do. So we have something called a blood brain barrier, which means very few molecules actually get through to the brain because it's so protected. Oestrogen goes straight through. So it really is everywhere in our body. If you think about it as a reproductive hormone, it's designed for us to have children. But implicit in being able to have children is to have an optimised heart, an optimised brain, an optimised bone structure to carry the weight, optimised muscles. So oestrogen actually has effects on all of those tissues. So around the perimenopause, oestrogen declines dramatically into postmenopause, where actually it's only detectable with high sensitivity assays. Women who were protected from heart disease beforehand now get heart disease. Who didn't have osteoporosis beforehand are now getting osteoporosis. So a lot of the diseases that are associated with older ageing actually only occur after that oestrogen loss. So before menopause, Women have less heart disease than men, they have less bone problems than men, they have less strokes than men, and then after menopause, they have as many heart attacks as men, they have as many strokes. You know, a few hundred years ago, the mean age of death was 50, <laughs> and the mean age of menopause is 50, so we didn't really see these diseases in women, so there just hasn't been any research. So actually, women tend to get worse heart disease than men. So if you look at um, immediate heart attacks, that's not as common in women, but having heart disease means you've got a disability in older age because you can't walk so far or you can't have as much exercise exertion, that's more common in women. In addition, two thirds of all dementia is in women. And osteoporosis really is much more common in women because that lack of oestrogen really does start to melt the bones. So that's why oestrogen is so important. And certainly there's a lot of evidence that oestrogen improves people's cognition. There's evidence in animal studies that oestrogen increases the hippocampus, which is the memory centre. There's a lot of evidence that oestrogen is protective and they've even done some really tiny trials in people who have dementia and shown that oestrogen has better performance in those people, but they're really small studies, so it's not something you'd want to, you know, say as a treatment yet. The HRT preparations have changed dramatically over the last 20 years. So the initial study at the turn of the century was using conjugated equine oestrogen. And this was actually taken from pregnant mares. And because it's from horses, um, humans actually had higher side effects of clotting with that preparation. And now we have much more modern preparations. And in fact, not just oral tablets, but there are now patches. And the patches in particular seem to have less side effects again than oral therapy. So things are evolving all the time. So often women have been thought to have really good health because women live longer. And we do live three to four years longer than men in this country. But what somehow has been missed with women now living a third of their lives in postmenopause without oestrogen, in fact, women have 3.7 times severe significant disability limiting activities of daily living than men of the same age. So, you know, we want a healthy, happy, good quality of life in our ageing, not just three or four more years. So I think this is a new target we have to look at now that we have an ageing population, that it's not just about years, but having treatments that actually give you better quality of life. Well, my takeaway from that, Darcy, is the next time someone calls me hormonal, I'm going to say, why, thank you. I don't picture you doing that at all, <laughs> uh, by the way. Hey, Joe, I think there's been a very positive shift in the way that we view elderly people here in Australia 
and in this part of uh, the world, other cultures have historically been much more appreciative of the wisdom and the benefit of getting older, which is a good thing. I absolutely agree. Well, when it comes to Heinze, he's on a quest not so much for eternal youth, but picture-perfect health. There really is no health hack out there that he has not put his body through. And he's got a little trick up his sleeve as well, Joe. He's booked himself in for a spellbinding session with a body magician. We'll check it out. The old saying, like a well-oiled machine, is certainly true when the mind and body are totally in sync. But so often due to a combination of lack of sleep, chronic pain, fatigue or even stress, that machine fails to reach its full potential. Now, one way of helping to heal the mind and body is through relaxation, which helps release tension, unlocking energy and vitality. And that's where the body magician comes in. If I go too deep here, your body starts to... Exactly. Yeah. Your body starts to fight me out. And now it won't let me back in next time. You get defensive. Yeah. Okay? Structurally, anatomically, anything that's going on in your body is going to sharpen your feet. It's where the rubber meets the road, yeah? yeah? So then I can really start to get a feel of where you're at. And we have this space to have a conversation, because I never want to approach your body like you're just a meat suit. You're this animated <laughs> consciousness within it. Already, I'm sensing there's something magic about Bruce Scott. He's blended his skills in Tai Chi, yoga, Japanese Shiatsu, Qigong, and various types of ancient massage with his knowledge of physiology and anatomy to create his own unique modality. And it goes a lot further than just another foot massage. Just lean back, lean back, lean back. Crazy as it is, how would it feel if your toes could relax? Oh, <laughs> look at that, look at that, look at that. Yeah. People will often come to me either very much for the physical. So I've got a sore knee, I've got a sore lower back, my neck's tight. Yeah. Looking for relief from those. Yeah. And that, that's beautiful. And then we'll do that and a whole nother world will open. Other people will come very much, I'm experiencing anxiety is a huge thing that people find me for. So being able to find a way of mitigating that, managing that, people will often come to me for that. And then um, the really interesting cases where I get to put on my Sherlock Holmes like deer hunter hat, <laughs> like what is going on here? Yeah. And that's now we're starting to build the trust. Now your body's starting to go, oh, okay, that was a little odd. Yeah. But this crazy guy can support my weight. Yeah. Cool. You are the sum total of everything you've experienced from the moment that you were first conceived all the way through to now. As much as possible, I'd prefer to see that rather than getting stuck in the story of he said, she said, when I was five, this happened. There's your centre. Yep. Just lean forward. Just, just lean, lean forward, forward and not give you any help. Just let go. Things get way more interesting when Bruce weaves his magic on the floor. I'm catching. You're driving, I'm catching. You're just falling. You're falling, I'm catching. We're flying. Cool. Ooh, hello. So how would it feel if you could relax your legs? Just let them fall. Yes, <laughs> look at that. Hello. Cool, 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 cool. Describe fly. Yeah. to someone who might not be aware of what you do. OK. Flying is an extrapolation of Thai massage in many ways. Thai massage uses gravity and the pouring of weight through the body. We've taken this beautiful radical shift and flipped it upside down so that your hips are supported by my feet and it decompresses the whole of your spine relieving all the pressure on the nervous system, literally turning your world upside down. Let your feet keep dropping toward the floor, just to the point where they can stay connected. And how would it feel if your belly could relax? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh yeah, there it is. That's relaxation for your organs. And if that's not a component that's feeling right for someone, can completely leave it out. It's not the only part of the show. The floor work is just as powerful. Doesn't look as good on Instagram, um, but it's just as powerful. And how does this feel? 
It's a feeling I've never felt before. Because <laughs> I've never been in this position before. It's really freeing because you're just like you're draped. I feel like a, a dishcloth draped on the sink. <laughs> Part of the beauty of this work is there's no expectation on you to be anything other than the way you are. How you are is perfect. How you ended up in the, the body that you're in, in the mental, emotional states that you're in, this is just how it happened. So being able to accept, like meet you where you are is the magic. And then everything from there is an invitation. Whole body relax. So he's called the body magician. Well, I feel like magic right now. I didn't know what to expect, but it is that perfect combination of massage and body work that really leaves you feeling light, free, and as if you're floating. And by floating, I mean flying. It promises to release tension, to clear your mindset, to unlock any physical and mental blockages. It's done exactly that, and this is only my first session. I can only imagine how I'll feel after the second, third, and fourth, because it's exactly what he says, that combination of the physical and the mental becoming one so that we're living our most authentic, free, happy, and healthy selves. Got a very clear recollection of one of my teammates in the late 90s coming out onto the training track in a pair of electric bright blue leggings and was laughed off the training track. Looked a bit like Olivia Newton John, my old teammate Steve Criddock. I'm going to name him. Uh, now, every athlete in the world has got a pair of uh, compression tights in their bag, Nick. It's just the way of the world. Well, one of the things you'd be aware of, Darcy, it's taken off in all sorts of sports because of the theory that compression helps improve circulation minimise muscle fatigue and potentially improve performance. But these are really heavy duty, hard to get on tights, aren't they? They're not the ones that I might say wear to Pilates or go for a run in. No, they're specially fitted according to your height and weight and they have to be really tight to work. Mm -hmm. So they're really difficult to get on and off. Well, having the correct sportswear that supports you physically and lifts your confidence when you're training is what it's all about, including when your body is in recovery. <laughs> What motivated me to really delve into compression tights and how they benefit recovery was from my time working with soccer teams when they sometimes have like a congested schedule. It'd be quite hard to recover fully before the next game or training that they might have. So looking at different strategies, a new one that I kind of came across was compression tights. Realised there wasn't as much research in that recovery strategy compared to say cold water immersion or different things like that. The focus of my research was looking at the recovery after exercise. So what is the benefit if you just wear the compression tights after you've done the exercise session? When you exercise, you get these, sometimes these microscopic tears in the muscle fibers, and then they can release these inflammation markers as a result. If there's an increase in those, they can lead to swelling within the muscle, and then that leads to the perception of soreness within that area. So if we could increase the blood flow, it can help with remove some of those inflammatory markers, but also the application of the compression kind of limits the space for that swelling to occur. So then if you can wear them for a couple of hours after exercise, it limits that swelling, and then that leads to less muscle soreness as a result. The main mechanism attributed to the benefit of wearing compression tights is an improvement in blood flow. But then also it has the potential to improve the delivery of nutrients to the, to the muscles that just did the exercise. And that's a very important indicator of recovery as well, that you can essentially deliver the nutrients that are required in order for the muscles to recover. I would say the most significant kind of point from our research was that we showed that wearing compression tights for four hours after exercise led to an improvement in blood flow, and then that coincided with a reduction of muscle soreness um, and an improvement back to overall exercise performance. So we looked at compression shorts, compression tights, and compression socks, and what we found was that compression tights lead to a greater improvement of blood flow to the entire limb. The potential reason for that is that it's essentially just covering more musculature in the lower body, therefore increasing more blood flow to that area. One of the best ways to identify, you know, that they are applying 
a high level of compression that's needed to see the benefits, is that they should essentially be pretty difficult to get on. You know, they shouldn't just slip on over your foot that easily. There should be a bit of a, a struggle to get on. And once they're kind of on, then they should feel really tight on as well, you know, that they're not slipping or sliding or anything like that. They are actually quite comfortable to wear, and I think that's a benefit of these kind of compression tights, is that they are comfortable to wear, and that encourages people to wear them after exercise. And I think that's kind of one of the benefits of compression tights as a recovery strategy, is that, you know, you can actually go about and do other things, whereas other strategies, like cold water immersion, you have to be within this ice bath, kind of freezing for the, for the 10 minutes. Um, whereas with the compression tights, you can, it's more of a, a passive form of recovery. Das, you're a dad of a teenage daughter. I've got one well on the way, but they're really tricky years to navigate, aren't they? Especially with the pressure of social media 24-7. It's like a really complex world for teenage girls at the moment. Jack, I was really shocked to read the Australian Women's Health magazine report that one in two girls actually wish they looked like someone else, and more than half of girls are suggesting that social media causes them to have a negative experience of the way they view themselves as well. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking, isn't it? But there are so many organisations that can help with that and improving girls' self-confidence and self-esteem, and the Butterfly Foundation is just one of them. Yeah, much-needed support. They do a brilliant job, the Butterfly Foundation. Unfortunately, in its expanding area, the need to support particularly young girls with eating disorders. We always like to focus on the things that we like best, and with that in mind, we've sent Jade K Global to find the best in sustainable beauty. Makeup for me has always been about collaboration and I'm about to meet a fellow makeup artist who's based here in Singapore. You hate doing eyeshadow, watch this, I'm gonna make it so easy. You only need one fluffy brush for this. So her Salim is best known for her engaging Instagram tutorials and makeup recreations, inspired by everyone from Sophia Loren to Taylor Swift. So what is your favourite part of being a makeup artist here? Um, I think it's just about, first of all, it's very different to being a makeup artist anywhere else because it is very, very humid here. Oh. And it, I'm sure you know it's no joke <laughs> if you step outside of the AC, like it is insane. So I think it has some very unique challenges, so much so that when I go somewhere else, I have to fully change my routine. You do, right? Uh, what would you say is a product like when you need that to stay and last? Uh, it, it's setting powder all yeah. the way, like sprays or no? Uh, sprays a little bit, but I worry with some sprays. I feel like with the humidity, I feel like it can look sort of gunky around yeah. the nose with the sweat. So I prefer to use a powder yeah. or like a more matte base, and then more strategic with highlighter to make the skin look a little more glowy. glowy. Yeah. Yep. Is there an aspect of makeup, regardless of beauty trends, that just never changes? I think so. I think in the last decade or so, we've seen, you know, the shift of really eye-focused makeup, and now it's going more to complexion and blush. But even then, complexion was still a big yeah. part, you know? I feel like skin prep or how you do your base is always in, right? You never learn goes how out. To, exactly. You learn how to do a base routine that works for you, and you can make it work forever. What's your ultimate makeup hack? I think for myself as a professional makeup artist and even for like regular consumers, I think finding multiple ways to use the same product is a great way because I don't have to pack so many things with me, you know? If you can take a lipstick or a lip tint and you can use it as a cheek tint as well, or you have five minutes to get ready for work, you're like, oh, oh okay, cool, done. done. And I think it's just so easy and I think more products should be dual use for sure. And what has been the highlight of Cosmoprof Asia for you? So to be here today and see so many people from across the world like yourself, <laughs> it's fun. It's really nice to meet everyone. You know, you think of how there are so many people in this huge room and we all have beauty in common, which is a bit like... crazy. Like everyone here works with beauty in some way. And I think that's it's fun. It's special, isn't it? It is and very I think, special. And I don't know about you, but I think even um, as makeup artists, as beauty lovers, it's a lot of the time in the past been more competitive. And I feel like in the room, it's like a collaborative, yeah, nice feeling. Like, we gotta, you know, help each other out. Gotta come yeah. together. I think so too.
Thanks to our beauty globe trotter Jade K there. And Dr Nick, we've covered a lot of women's health issues on the show today, but what are some good exercises for women over 50? Well, the evidence says that walking is one of the best things you can do. It's free, it's low impact, and you can do it with your mates. Also, anything in water, so swimming, aqua aerobics, the really important thing is to do something every day, no matter what your age. And Dr Nick, we live in Melbourne, which I feel is the cycling capital of Australia. You love to ride your bike, you even ride to the show here, but when you look at cycling, it's predominantly men, isn't it? Yeah, well, my bike is for transport, Jack. You won't catch me going round in circles in Lycra. Give it time. <laughs> but it's true, there is a gender imbalance, because mm. only one third of cyclists here in Australia are women. And now there's a push to bring that up to 50%. And one group is helping to do that. They're called Ladies Back on Your Bike. How are you? When it first started up, it was women who hadn't ridden a bike since they left school. So, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Cycling has been a constant in Jacinta Costello's life. She fell in love with the sport in the 70s. It's important for women to take part in any activity that they like. I just happen to like cycling. Hey, just make sure that, you know, we're all nice and safe, look after each other, and of course, the most important is, enjoy yourselves. After a lifetime affair with riding, Jacinda applied for a job to teach a short course in cycling fundamentals. She was being paid to teach 16 women, but the response was overwhelming. 60 women replied. So I was absolutely shocked, but Cycling Australia was paying for 16. So I did the 16 and then thought, gosh, what am I going to do with the rest? I thought I'll have to teach them. That was the start of her venture. Ladies, back on your bike. She teaches women how to ride, no matter their age. So I taught a 75-year-old recently, which was pretty exciting. Or skill level. Maybe they've never used gears before. So we show them how to use the gears. We show them how to get the drink bottle out and drink while they're going. Uh, you know, how to, to brake properly to make sure they're not going to just jam on their front brake and go straight over. Some pretty simple stuff. But if they're shown it, um, they really catch on well and it's fantastic. Watch this car. Passing again. Riders are divided up into different groups depending on their experience. From those who have never ridden before to multi-day trekkers and everyone in between. Keep it straight. Just look over your shoulder. I never have been in a club or anything else with a group of women and it was just amazing. It was it changed my attitude to so many things. It comes in and pushes your bike yes, sideways. And on where the push but for me personally, um, I've really stepped outside my comfort zone. And I would recommend it to anybody. And you can always, if you've ridden a bike as a child, you can get back on it. You never forget how to ride a bike. It's I probably suffered a bit of anxiety. I was separated, and you know, I was looking to do something that I was going to enjoy for me instead of thinking about my family and work, which had been much of my life. I, um, I was doing something, I wanted to do something for me. Watch yourself, take your own decision whether to change. I just see a lot of camaraderie, a lot of amazing improvement in their cycling. And I see that girls will often tell me, thanks so much, Jacinda, for starting this up, because they've really, really enjoyed the cycling, enjoyed the camaraderie, and that it has changed their lives, that now they've got a meaning to it, it's more fun, they feel there's something to get out of bed for, yeah. Well, Das, before the break, we met the all-female cycling group who are putting new meaning into pedal power and something that is back in a big way that harks back to our school days is hula hooping. It's back, is it? Yes. I can't remember the last time I saw a hula hoop, Joe. Are you sure? I, I promise you. Okay. Now, you might not be aware, but I'm an outstanding hula hooper. I'd it's like actually, to see that on the House of Wellness. I tell you what, I broke records at my primary school really? for my hula hooping and I love that it's back. <laughs> Some people are loving the hula hooping for the nostalgia, while others are discovering for the very first time.
If you're a child of the 60s, chances are you had a hula hoop. But who put hips and hoop together in the first place? I did a little research. If that's feeling solid and flat and comfortable and like you're like, yeah, I'm nailing it tonight, hop your feet together and push harder. No surprises that the ancient Greeks wore onto it. They exercised with hoops to tone their abs. And the Hawaiians, well, they had hip moves down to a fine art. But it was right here in the land of Oz that it all came together. Imagine there's a chocolate-coated strawberry stuck to the wall and you're just like, mine. When an American entrepreneur saw Aussie kids playing with timber hoops, bam, the plastic hula hoop was born. And 60 years later, the hips are still swiveling. Because what happens is if the knees are going, it's like the hoop's going to go to where the party's at. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah, so we want to get the party more up here. Yeah, less circling. My name's Donna Sparks, and I like to call myself the Who Poncho. Oh, I love that. <laughs> All right, welcome to tonight's class. We are going to be covering things beginning with the letter W tonight. So we're going to be looking at waist hooping, weaves and wedges and whatever else happens. So how do you describe it to someone who's curious? Is it a full body workout? Is it cardio? Like, what kind of a workout is it? Most people assume that it's mainly working with the belly because when people think about hooping, they think of waist hooping. Mm -hmm. But there's so many moves that you can do on different parts of your body with your arms out or with your legs or holding different shapes that it ends up being not just core, it's legs, it's arms, it's all of the supporting muscles across the upper and lower back. Grip strength gets really good, so you can end up having these crazy forearm muscles just because you're holding a hoop in this way. And we're going side, 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 side. Strong body, strong belly. It's not like doing reps at the gym where you're like, give me another 10 and you're sort of fighting this battle. It's like, oh, I'll just play here for a little longer and try this for a little longer and suddenly you can do something and it felt like play rather than struggle. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a giggle in it that doesn't exist elsewhere. <laughs> Everyone do this for a minute. Keep the hand in. <laughs> Lead with the elbow down. The playfulness is something that I want to bring more of that into my life. So this is definitely playful. And I think when you're older, it's good to do new things that are out of your comfort zone. So that's definitely, I'm in that category. When this arm's up, as it comes down, that's the cue for this one to go. So it's like switch. Yeah, so you're gonna go dominant arm switch almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're gonna. It's addictive. It's it like anything. And once you get like those few couple moves that you get a flow, like a combo, and mm. you get that feeling where you actually feel like it's like a solidified move, you, um, yeah, you just feel like really good about yourself that you've been able to like piece the little puzzles together. Yeah. I would have thought that this was easy, but looking at it now, I don't think I'd go very well. <laughs> Requires a lot more core than I ever imagined. Eyes up, chest up, heart open, body strong, belly on. I think we take exercise very seriously sometimes, but you guys look like you were having the best time. Yes, I felt like every time I get the hula hoop going, I feel like I'm seven again. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just in a room of seven-year-old girls and we're all having a giggle and having fun and falling about laughing. Go, 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 go! <laughs> yes! <laughs> People should come to hoop class because it's fun fitness, it's meditative, it lands you back in your body, it quiets the mind, and I feel like there's this nice balance between, like, challenge and achievement which is, I guess, what creates flow. All the research, Jack, says as we get older, we're less prepared to try new things. What was the last new thing you gave a go? <laughs> I tried TikTok and it was a disaster. Not for you? <laughs> not for me, not for me. But they reckon hula can change your body. But less fun is the research that shows that drinking alcohol while pregnant can change the way your child looks. I think we all know that message around the problems of drinking for pregnant women, but I find this uh, amazing. New research is showing that even a glass a week for a mum while pregnant can actually change the facial features of an unborn child, which is staggering. 
that's right. So they found that those women who drank, their child in the first trimester actually changed compared to those who didn't drink. Their facial features did not. Reluctant to give advice to pregnant women, Jack. Not really my special area, but you probably think drinking is going to become a bit risky, isn't it? I just think that women need all the help and support that they can get. But what they also need is plenty of iron. One of my biggest appreciations of the nutrition world, Zoe, is that you can get your hit of vitamins and minerals from all different types of foods, meaning if you're not a fan of one, it doesn't mean you're missing out. And you know what, Lukey, that couldn't be more true than for iron. You see, most people think of red meat as a great source of iron, which it is, but I'm using tofu today to boost my iron levels. Well, that is going to keep our veggie friends very happy. I'm going all things pescatarian with my oysters a la Luke style. What do you think? Oh, sounds good. Now, I hope the ladies at home are taking note because obviously we're at greater risk of iron deficiency. Pregnant and breastfeeding women need more iron and menstruating women are facing ongoing blood loss, which is another way that we can lose iron. Others are at risk too. In fact, up to 5% of Australians experience iron deficiency anemia and the symptoms aren't pleasant. Things like severe fatigue, weakness and pale skin. And that's because iron is involved with transporting things such as oxygen in the blood, which gives us the precious energy we need. So what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what not to do, and that is to self-diagnose with Dr Google. That is because the signs of iron deficiency can also be associated with other conditions. So the best thing, make an appointment with your GP, have a consultation and create a treatment plan. And to help maintain iron levels in the body, it's important to familiarise yourself with the many foods that contain this important mineral. You can also look for a supplement with a clinically researched ferrous shell form of iron as it's gentle on the gut. Including vitamin C in both your diet and supplements can be a massive help because it aids with iron absorption. Now, talking about absorption, I cannot wait to try one of those oysters. As long as I can have some of that incredible salad. I, I say we swab. Done yeah. and done. <laughs> Get Nourished is brought to you by Go Healthy's Go Iron One A Day, a convenient, high-strength formulation to relieve tiredness and fatigue associated with iron deficiency. Now, I know a lot of people that don't think fun and run are two words that should <laughs> ever go together, but one that unites all of us is the run for the kids, raising money for the Royal Children's Hospital right here in Melbourne. Well, it actually does. I love a run around the city because all the main roads are closed off and the joggers take over. I love that. Well, this actually became a problem recently in America. A Philadelphia man who was waiting for a liver transplant, but his organ actually got stuck in traffic because of a marathon. So the surgeon who was performing the operation joined the run and went and got the organ himself. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and, and livers only have a very short window, just a few hours before they start to deteriorate. So thanks to this surgeon's sprint, Amazing. the transplant went ahead and the patient did really well. Well, I love a good news story to end the show. And thanks to everyone for joining us again on The House. Of wellness. Of course, check out myself and Gerald Quickly every Sunday on House of Wellness Radio. And don't miss the April lift out with a super fit Guy Sebastian on the cover. Big thanks to the team at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you again next time.